And I, I mean, I, that was like my favorite show growing up. And then I watched um, Family Matters. I used to watch that quite a bit with Urkel, and I used to be able to do the Urkel thing when I had a higher voice. Did I do that? I used to be able to do that pretty well. But there is one show I remember my parents even watching with us, which was kind of interesting because they didn't hardly ever watch little sitcoms and stuff like that when I was growing up. That wasn't my father's taste or anything like that. But there was one that had a theme song that went, Love and a marriage, love and a marriage goes together like horse and a carriage. All right. And so I was married with children. All right. And so, but the fact that a love and a marriage, it can't be separated. It's one whole thing that they have to be together. And they have to be without part. They have to be together. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning is the marriage that goes on. And so starting in verse 25 of chapter 5 of Ephesians, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, because he who loves his wife loves himself. There is something about the fact that Christ designed the family, I mean, God designed the family right after (laughs) what Christ was to the church. He designed husbands to love their wives and wives to submit to their husbands, just like Christ was the head of the church and the church is supposed to submit to Christ. And there's something about that that's super important. And so we, even in our natural sense and what we understand about weddings, we love weddings, right? We get excited about them. Winston's shaking his head no, he doesn't love weddings, but that's just because I'm sure it's Winston. But either way, that's right, oh, three girls, he's not looking forward to it. All right, so with that though, we love to go to weddings because it celebrates something new, something beginning, a life that's coming together. But what we can't understand is what a wedding meant to the Jewish people back in the day. When, when the ancient times hap- were, there were weddings and stuff, it meant something totally different, and the way weddings happened was totally different than the way weddings happen today. So when we get engaged here in America, it just means that we have made a commitment to this person, but it's not an absolute commitment, right? When we, when we get engaged, we're saying, yeah, I, I would like to be married to this person, but that doesn't mean that you absolutely have to, Correct. Well, it was totally different in the ancient Jewish times. And so that's what we're going to work through today is what did it mean a marriage wise? So there were basically two major parts to a marriage back in the day. And, what, and I'm going to use back in the day so y'all, y'all be okay with me saying that. The betrothal was the, main, the first part. And a betrothal was not just like engagement is today. Betrothal meant that you were legally married upon that time period. So if you betrothed somebody today, you can get out of it. Back then, it meant you were married and that you had a legal responsibility for that wife that you have taken on. And so in your notes, the first blank that goes there is the betrothal. The betrothal. It's where the husband, the man that is going to get his prospective wife, comes from his father's house. He makes his way to his prospective bride's house and talks to the father of the bride. And they initiate a covenant of what the man is going, the groom is going to do to take care of the bride. What will he do in his marriage to make sure that everything is going to be all right? And so... I wanted to read from Hosea 2 today. If I can. 
Hosea 2, starting in verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Accor a door of hope. And there she shall answer is in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my bell. For I will remove the names of the bells from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land, and I will make you lie down in safety. And here's the part, I will make you lie down in safety, and I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice in steadfast love, and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. He makes a covenant with His people. He makes a covenant with His church. A covenant to say that I will protect you, I will lead you, I will guide you, and I will make you one with Myself. Christ makes a covenant with his church. He is making a covenant saying that I will protect you. I will take care of you. And I will lead you if you will be my bride. But coming along with that covenant, it wasn't just a covenant. It wasn't just something that they could say, you know, that covenant, yeah, I, I'm good with that, but what are you going to give me extra? They had to give like a dowry back then. So something that would be to hold their place and say a value and say that the man is actually going to take care of this wife that he's about to, to take from his father's house. He wants to know that she's going to be taken care of, right? The father wants to know she's going to be taken care of and not going to have to worry about what's going on. What they called this was a mohar. So back in the day it was called a mohar and it was given in exchange for the wife. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness. This is verse 14. And speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Accor a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. So he's giving her property or giving her some kind of thing that says this is value for if I decide to divorce you or if I decide to do something that you have something to live by. I'm not just going to take this lightly and take this marriage lightly. We've all been to places and dealt with relationships where somebody took it lightly, where they shouldn't have. And what the father wants to know is this man committed. Right? For his bride. But what did Christ give as his mohar? He gave his life. In 1 Corinthians 7.23... Y'all forgive me, it's, i got so many little pieces of paper, you're gonna, it's going to take me a while just to get through them. Well, you were bought with a price. Did you know you were bought with a price? You were bought with Christ's life. He chose you. Isn't that nice to know that the husband came looking for the bride? He came looking for you. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. He called each of us. He called the church to follow after him. To grow in him. To become one with him. And then after... So during this Jewish ceremony, during this betrothal period, they made a covenant, and they gave a mohar, and to seal that covenant, and to say that everything is fine, and we're ready to go on this, and we're ready to move forward, and that she's going to be my wife, they would drink a glass of wine together. Do you know where we got the, supper, the institution of the supper that we take last week where we did the bread and when we did the cup, we got it from the marriage 
that we were supposed to have with the church. In Matthew 26, I don't think I even have this one marked. But Matthew 26, starting in verse 26, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Listen, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant. This is to seal the covenant. This is the blood of the covenant that he has given us, and that we have the ability now to live in. And he is saying that he has sealed that as our bridegroom. For our church, our bridegroom is Jesus and is Christ. But after the betrothal period, when they are legally married, this odd thing happens in Jewish culture. And what happens is they have a a time of separation. So your second blank on there is the separation period. The separation period was a period of 12 months where the bridegroom and the bride were separated from each other. Now that seems unorthodox for us because we're used to, once that engagement happens, we may see each other and stuff and be around each other, but they were totally apart. And they didn't see each other for a long period of time. And there was different responsibilities that the bridegroom was handling and different responsibilities that the bride was handling. And so even though they were legally married, they had these different things they were doing. And so flip with me to John 14, if you you have your Bible handy. In John 14, we're going to get an instance of what Christ was doing as he was apart. And he's telling his disciples where he's going and what he's heading to. This is before he gets to the cross. And that before everything happens, and he's wanting to let them know that everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be okay. And listen to these words. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. He's saying, I came from God. And if you believe in Him, I'm so one with Him that you also, I mean, believe in me as well. See, what happened in Jewish culture is that the bridegroom would go away to his father's house to prepare rooms for the bride to come and stay at his father's house. It was an interesting experience, but it was just a time for them to prepare for the bride to make their journey over to his his father's house. In verse 2 of chapter 14, In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Christ is preparing a room for His church. He's preparing a place for us to dwell with Him forever. See, we're living in that separation period right now. We may have had salvation where we've sealed the co- He sealed the covenant for us. And He paid the price. And we came to know Him and respond to His, his call towards us. But if you're a Christian today, you're living in that separation period right now. That 12 months that's apart from Him... And what is he doing right now? Preparing a place for you. For your coming. As the bride. Well, if the bridegroom's responsibility is to be working in his father's house to prepare a place, what is our responsibility supposed to be as his church? And so, Matthew 25 gives us a brief glimpse into this. And it's a parable that Jesus was telling of the ten virgins. A parable saying, what, what is our responsibility as the bride, as the church, as everybody that is seeking Him and has been called by Him, what is our responsibility? Starting in verse 1, 
Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flask of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. So what is our responsibility as the bride of Christ? What was the responsibility as the bride of a Jewish wedding back in the day was to be ready for the groom. To be prepared for when his coming was to happen. See, they didn't know when he was coming. They knew it was going to be about a period of 12 months. But it usually happened at night. And it usually happened right as they were getting there. There would be a shout the groom was coming, there would be a shout, and they would say, come out to meet me. And the wife would head out to meet the bridegroom who had just shown up. But what would happen if we're not ready? What if we don't bring our oil? What if we're stuck in that spot saying, well, I got my lamp, I've got the salvation, but there is a part that is sanctification that happens in between. So our goal and our responsibility as Christians, as followers of Christ, is to be sanctified in Him. How do we do that? Reading His Word. Make sure we stay in communication through prayer. Looking after the least of these. What they called it was her trousseau. Trousseau. I'm not sure if I'm saying that word right, but that's what it was called back then. Was a, They prepared to be ready for the things she would need in her marriage. What things do we need in our marriage with Christ? Everything that would lead us to Christ. But what would often happen, and often happens with us, is we get enticed by other things that are around. When the bridegroom is away... Who do we look to? It's easy to look to the bridegroom when the bridegroom is present. It's easy to see what we're supposed to be doing when the bridegroom is right in front of us. But what happens when he's away? When we're separated? When we're apart from where we should be? Exodus 20 tells us that we have idols. We look after, God calls us to be pure and clear of idols. But Exodus 20 and verse 3, this is reading of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of their fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. See, we don't think about the things that we do on a daily basis as idols. We don't think about the things that we go after and we seek after and we do it without intentionality. But the things we often look for, I got this new phone that's supposed to help me do things that are helpful, you know, for the church and for other things, and I got it. But that thing is distracting as can be, all right? Like it is an idol for me if I don't watch it. But it doesn't have to be something physical like that. 
It could be just reading the Word just to say, I read the Word. That's an idol. Anything that we distracts us from the focus we have on the bridegroom is an idol. And being aware of that is just being intentional about the groom that you're seeking, that you're waiting on, you're excited about, but don't let that excitement distract you or get distracted by other things that are going there. Be there for the excitement. And God's will. What is God's will during this separation time? John 17. This is Jesus' high priestly prayer right before He's to be taken, right before He is to be given as a sacrifice. He's praying to God. And he, He issues probably the most beautiful words in the Bible about what He's asking God to do for His people that He's been given. And I'm going to start in verse 16, but I urge you to read the rest of the prayer if you have the time. Verse 16 of chapter 17 of John. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. See, once you got that marriage covenant, you're no longer part of this world. You're no longer part of this, the house of Satan, the Father's house here. You're part of His house. You just haven't left yet. But verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so have I sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Verse 20, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. See, what is God's will for us? To be one in Christ, and to be one with each other. Our, Our goal here, as given by Christ, is to be one with Him. In marriage, two become one. In marriage, two become one so that we can serve, so that we can grow, and that we can glorify God. We are supposed to be being sanctified by Him and through Him in our time away, in our separation. And then the last part of the wedding ceremony, the last part that comes... A Jewish wedding, you have the betrothal, you have the separation period, and then you have the marriage feast and consummation with that. The coming of the bridegroom comes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, verse 6, let's start in verse 16. For, I, for the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. When the bridegroom comes to get his bride, when he comes back, do we know the hour? No, we do not. We don't know when he's coming, but when he does come, will we be ready? And when He calls, we'll be ready to run to Him so that we can be with Him forever. There's a a powerful verse in Revelation 19. Revelation 19, starting in verse 6. John is seeing a vision of heaven. He's seeing a vision of the new Jerusalem. What's going to happen? Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory. 
For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. When we go back, when we're excited and we're pumped because we're there, will we be ready? It was granted for her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. As the bride of Christ, as His bride, we have to be ready. He's coming back. He's made the way possible for us. We're married. We're just not living at home with Him yet. But His goal is to make us one with Him. Ephesians, back to Ephesians 5 where we started. In verse 31. I'll let you turn for this one. Verse 31. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. It's a picture. It's a picture of what it will be one day. We're still, too, living on our own, living in different places, striving to be one. But one day when we get get home, we will be one with Christ. We will be one. We will be sanctified. We will be the way it always should be, where it was, where it began in the garden. One with Christ. It's the consummation that happens when we get home. There is one more verse we're going to look at this morning, or one more group of verses in Isaiah chapter 62. I don't know if you, like me, have been living in this marriage not knowing what you're doing, not really paying attention to what you're doing, not being intentional about where you're living and where you're working. But there's a calling for all of us. For Zion's sake, this is verse 1, For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet. We're the new Jerusalem. Until her righteousness goes forth as brightness, and her salvation as a burning torch, the nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called my delight is in her and your land married. Those two terms, my delight is in her, in the original language are called hefziba. Hefziba, my delight is in her. And your land married, Beulah. Beulah land. One day, we're going to leave this earth and we're going to be at home with God. One with Him. And that place where we're going to be is Beulah land. We're going to be married. There's no going to be any more separation. There's not going to be any tears. There's not going to be any problems. Just one with Him, worshiping the Father for all time. That's an eternal place. It never ends. I've had some great marriages in my life uh, in terms of with my parents and with my grandparents to see and to look into. So, my parents have been married, I think, coming up on 38 years, which is an awesome testament to their, their love and care for each other. My parents on my father's side have been married for 71 years. 
And then on my mother's side, before they, they both passed away, 75 years. And it's a testament to how long and caring they were for each other. And yeah, they, they would spat every so often. And they would have problems with each other. But neither one of them would ever trade that marriage for anything else. Guys, we're going home to be one with Christ. We're going home to be one with Him so that we can serve Him and glorify God forever. Why wouldn't we want that? There's an old song that comes to mind that a lot of you probably know called Sweet Beulah Land. And I thought as we close today and we think over His mercy and His grace and how much He cares for us that we could sing that chorus to that song. I don't know if all of you know it, but we're not going to play it We're just going to sing it together. So, if everybody would stand. Beulah land, I'm longing for you. And someday, on the stand where my home shall be like me, you're looking forward to that day. You're looking forward to being home, but while we're in this separation period, are you going to keep your eyes on Christ? Are you going to stay focused? There's that beautiful story of Mary as she's anointing the feet of Jesus and she's pouring out the oil, and I think I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, and she's pouring out the oil on them, on Jesus And the disciples are sitting back looking like, why are you doing this? This is expensive. This is a moronic move. Why are you doing this? And give this to the poor, sell it, give it to the poor. And it could be a great, great thing for Christ. But Mary was so close to Christ and so paying attention, she was at his feet. The only thing she could see was Jesus. How strong is your marriage today? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for this time together, Lord. Thank You for these saints, Lord, and that our care is for You. Lord, we love You. We are so excited to serve You. But most of all, we just need that oneness with You. Lord, in this separation period, would You help us to be faithful? Would You help us to keep our eyes in the right place, to focus on the right things, which is only You? And out of that abundance that we get from that, Lord, then that we let that be a byproduct to the world. Lord, it's by nothing we do, and we know it by nothing we do, we can make right the things of this earth. But by your grace and living in it through faith, we know we can be one with you, Lord. And we ask for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, guys-